all hear me? So we are finally at the third lesson of liturgy and art with uh, Maurizio and, uh, and brother James. So very quick technical reminder. So he will have the possibility to ask questions at the end of the talk. Uh, just write to me question or raise your hands and if you know how to use the reaction and uh, I will I will go one by one so if you don't if you think you're not be cold or I, I didn't see you don't worry because it's you know I'll, it will maybe you will be the third in the queue so you just need to to wait so uh, as we said uh, the last time we we uploaded on our website the list of uh, paintings and uh, and uh, and biblical read readings uh, so that you can download from uh, uh, the home page of our website you will find all the the three lessons um, yeah that's i think is it uh brother james will join us later because he's he's preaching at the because now he's deacon so he's preaching at uh, mass at half past four so in brompton so he will uh, join us a little bit later so we will start with maurizio one second i give you the microphone there you go and Hello, good evening. A warm welcome to this third walk. Thank you, Mattia, and looking forward to seeing you, Brother James, later on. Um, so I think that we can start straight away. So we are, as I said, uh, at our third uh, week. Uh, the, the title, the theme is Welcoming the Unforeseen. And it covers the third week of Advent from the 13th from today to the 19th. And before talking about this painting by uh, Mariotto Albertinelli, The Visitation, I would like just to go back to the end of our previous talk. As you remember, uh, we talked about the Annunciation and briefly about the Immaculate Conception. So it was generally speaking, just one theme. And today it's more complicated. There are at least the three narratives that intertwined. Uh, one is about the visitation. Uh, one is about John the Baptist and Joseph and the genealogy. So the Annunciation, you probably remember this beautiful uh, fresco by Beato Angelico. And one of the sentences pronounced by the angel was, uh, your king's woman, Elizabeth, has in her old age herself conceived a son. She, whom people called Baron, is now in her sixth month for nothing is impossible to God. So the uh, unforeseeable uh, can become possible. And uh, Mary replies, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. Now, then the next the sentence in the sequence uh, is Mary set out and went as quickly as she could to a town in the hill country of Judah. She went to Zachariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. And this is the moment when uh, the Virgin Mary uh, meets Elizabeth. The painting is by Mariotto Albertinelli. The title is The Visitation, 1503. It's in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. And it's relatively big. It's a two meters, a 32 centimeters by one meter 46. And it's oil on panel. 
Now, I would like just to draw your attention to the, the next sentence pronounced by Elizabeth. Now, as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the setting is uh, a setting in Florence. It is a beautiful arch and the two ladies uh, meet. And uh, I will draw your attention to something that always uh, uh, struck my imagination because in the sequence of sentences, it seems that uh, the, uh, the end of the Annunciation and when Our Lady starts or she goes to visit her cousin is roughly just around the corner. So I would like to show you the map, um, three maps actually, because on the left-hand side, you see probably the clearer one, because Our Lady had to cover a distance from Nazareth, where the Annunciation took place, to Ein Karem, where Elizabeth lived, that is in the outskirts of Jerusalem. So on the first map on the left, you see Nazareth in the north, near Cana, near the Sea of Galilee, and Jerusalem is roughly at the bottom near Bethlehem, written in red. So it's a long distance, it's 160 kilometers. And the map in the middle shows you that it's quite uh, mountainous, it's not plain. So there's uh, a difference in uh, uh, sea level of about 400 meters uphill. So, our Lady had to walk that distance uphill and pregnant. Well, there are other, um, other ways to look at this journey. Probably um, uh, Joseph helped uh, Mary, maybe in a caravan, or he organized the trip. But according to the readings, uh, um, Mary goes straight away to her cousin just to uh, check that really she was uh, uh, expecting a baby. And this is again uh, a way to reinforce that idea of a faith and reason. She could have said, okay, the angel gave me that message. It was confirmed by the readings, but the last sentence that I read to you about Elizabeth uh, prompted her to go and visit her, just to check that uh, uh, it was true. Not because she didn't believe that, but uh, she wanted to, to uh, being in a way reinforced in her faith. And it's very reasonable if you think about that. The map, you see Nazareth in the north and Jerusalem and Bethlehem in the south. And uh, next week we will find out why <laughs> baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem and not in Jerusalem or in Nazareth where the Annunciation took place. Now I took another example of uh, a visitation. This is by uh, Piero di Cosimo, the visitation with the St. Nicholas and St. Anthony. It's about 1489-1490. It's an oil on panel. It's a big painting. As you can see, the shape is a square because it's about two meters by two meters. And it's at the National Gallery of Washington in the United States. I highly recommend, if you have the, the interest, uh, later on after the talk, uh, whenever you want, to check uh, in the website of the National Gallery uh, Washington and in London, because you can magnify, you can enlarge the paintings, and you can see all the details that are very difficult to, to make out when, when I talk. Now you can see here the two ladies uh, um, meeting, uh, the young virgin on, on the left with this uh, beautiful ultramarine blue uh, mantle. Uh, she, she's about to embrace her elderly cousin. And uh, in that moment, there's the leap of the unborn uh, Baptist inside St. Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth, and that's why I chose it, among other reasons, um, in the gesture, and if we had the chance to emphasize, to magnify the mouth, that she's talking 
And she says that blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And it's exactly one of the, the sentences in the Hail Mary. Now, the, the painting is quite complex and uh, there are so many scenes. Uh, so if you look on the right hand side in the background, there is a crowd uh, roughly at the middle and it's the massacre of the innocents. But I don't want to talk about that today. It's on the 28th of December, so it's in the Christmas uh, liturgy. But above the crowd, there is a church. And again, you have to go to the National Gallery of Washington website to spot it. But th there is the Annunciation as a fresco on the facade of the, of the church. Let's see if I can point it with my arrow here. So this is the crowd. And then above, there is a church. And uh, there is the Annunciation as a fresco there. Now, the, the landscape beautifully represented as a change in the color of leaves. So on the right, uh, it seems autumn. On the left, uh, the leaves are green. It's a new season. Two babies are about to be born, Jesus and John the Baptist. Now, on the other side, so looking at the painting on the left, you see just above uh, St. Nicholas' head, there's the uh, nativity, yeah, the nativity with the shepherds. So, so many scenes put together by Piero di Cosimo. And above them, you know, on this winding road, just below the rock, uh, the three magi, the three kings are going towards the crib to pay homage to uh, baby Jesus. Now, why uh, St. Nicholas on the left and St. Anthony Abbott on the right are here. Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Sometimes it's because uh, uh, the, um, the people who commissioned the, the painting had their names, Anthony or St. Nicholas. And uh, Anthony, let's start with St. Nicholas in red. St. Nicholas uh, um, is reading a book, is Wisdom, uh, chapter one, uh, one to six. And it says, and I quote, love justice. You who judge the earth, think of the Lord in goodness and seek him in integrity of heart. This is also because uh, uh, the Caponi family uh, commissioned the painting and they were bankers. And so they probably needed reminding to love justice. Now at the bottom, just uh, near the red uh, dress, you see three golden balls. Let's see if I can, yeah. And these are our attributes. Attributes are symbols uh, which help us to identify the saint. And uh, the story uh, goes that uh, um, St. Nicholas gave uh, uh, money to a poor peasant in marrying off his three daughters. And if you wonder why uh, St. Nicholas uh, is the, the saint associated to children or, or children who uh, receives gifts, uh, we celebrated St. Nicholas on the 6th of December, is because uh, he made many miracles helping children. Now on the right hand side, uh, there's St. Abbot. And St. Abbot is uh, writing and with this long beard and uh, he's wearing a pair of spectacles, as you can see, uh, glasses at the time, they were certainly invented. So the, you can see that uh, he's wearing uh, spectacles, he's writing. And uh, if, you, if you look just um, on the bottom uh, left hand side, there's a, a stick, um, it's a, like a cross and uh, the shape of a tau. Tau is a T in Greek, the letter T. And at the time the cross had that shape. So it's a way to support himself because he's uh, old, he's tired, but also because it's the symbol of the cross. Now, near the, the cross, I hope you have identified the cross. Um, sorry that it goes, it's very sensible. Very, uh, here we are, let's see if I can show you. Yes, there's a, there's a bell nearby. And the bell is a symbol of uh, St. Nicholas and there's a pig here. 
just near the beard. If you if you look at the beard, uh, St. Uh, uh, Anthony Abbott, sorry, St. Anthony Abbott's beard, you see the pig. Because uh, um, in the uh, 12, uh, second or third century, he was associated to the fact that to raise money, he uh, raised the pigs. And uh, to call pigs, he needed a, a little bell. And so that's why you have the, ta the, the cross, the bell, and the swine to identify St. An uh, Anthony Abbott. A reference to the fact that uh, St. Nicholas represents the divine, this gener generosity, this love to the children, so is next to the Virgin Mary, who is about to give birth to Jesus. And uh, St. Anthony Abbott is associated to monasticism. He lived in the desert. Uh, he's the one who started the movement of the monks uh, and spread all over Europe uh, uh, as far as Ireland. So he's more associated to John the Baptist, uh, who he, he lived in the uh, in the desert. So this is the moment uh, the the two ladies uh, uh, meet. But the next uh, work uh, is extraordinary um, to me because uh, um, you can see the baptism and uh, the um, visitation on the same painting. I, I think probably it's the only example where you have two scenes. 30 years uh, in different in time uh, difference. So the, the two ladies, the Virgin Mary on the left, um, the aged uh, Saint Elizabeth, um, they are talking, uh, they are on the left on this rocky landscape, there, there are two angels, but right uh, there's uh, Christ um, baptized by uh, John the Baptist on the right hand side. So uh, it, it's extraordinary that the two ladies that who are expecting uh, baby Jesus and John the Baptist, then they see the future 30 years ahead. And uh, you probably notice that uh, Elizabeth is pointing towards the baptism. Uh, Zaganelli is um, an Italian artist from Ravenna. Uh, and uh, this painting was an altarpiece in 1514, was made in 1514. And it's at the National Gallery in London, but I'm afraid you can't see it at the, at the moment. Now, as I said, the narrative is quite complicated because we go backwards and forwards. And uh, now we have seen the baptism, um, Christ baptized by uh, John the Baptist, but that's the end of John the Baptist's life. And it's the beginning of uh, uh, Christ's mission. So we have to go back. We have to go back and I'm following the liturgy. I'm not um, showing you painting because I wanted to, but this is the liturgy of this week. And uh, um, this is the moment when Zachariah, Elizabeth's husband and uh, John the Baptist's father receives the announce the message from the angel. Now, this is a fresco. Uh, it's a three meters by four meters, more than four. So it's a huge fresco. It's by Domenico Ghirlandaio, uh, was a painted in 1486, 1490. And it's in the beautiful church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Now, if you have the chance, or if you are curious or interested, uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio painted seven frescoes about John the Baptist's life. So uh, I, I'll show you only this one, but uh, there are other six if you want to, to see them. And uh, this is the moment when Zachariah in the middle on the right uh, in red uh, is um, purifying the altar. There's a thurible swinging and the thurible is a container where you have incense and you purify the altar. So uh, Zachariah is a priest in the temple in Jerusalem. So very important. There were many, but uh, he is one of them. And all of a sudden, the angel in yellow with this uh, beautiful wing uh, in green and red, he says to uh, Zachariah something. And I paraphrase now. So, the old priest is doing his duties in the temple when suddenly the angel Gabriel appears. And Gabriel tells Zachariah that he will soon become the father of a son 
who must be named John. The old man asks for a sign as he finds it hard to believe the angel. Now he finds it hard to believe the angel because it is very old. And also you probably remember his wife, Elizabeth is barren. She can't give birth to, to babies. So uh, Zachariah very reasonably says, well, okay, <laughs> I'm going to be a father, but I want a sign. And, and Gabriel then tells him, he will not be able to speak until his son is born. So when Gabriel leaves, Zachariah is immediately struck dumb. So he can't use his voice. He can't talk anymore. Now, Girlandayo, you probably remember I showed you um, a fresco in the Sistine Chapel about the calling of the apostles. And uh, this one uh, is in Florence, it's not in Rome. But always Girlandayo introduces figures from his time. And all these people who got nothing to do with the scene, uh, they are from the Tornaboni family who commissioned the, the fresco. Now, another narrative that it's very important to bear in mind is St. Joseph, because you probably remember, we saw a beautiful painting by Raphael, the marriage. But St. Joseph um, has to face a very difficult situation. Uh, his wife uh, is expecting a baby, but is not the father. So it's very, very um, um, just and uh, honorable. And um, he probably decides to, um, to accept this, but to, um, to ask Mary to leave. But as you can see, there is a dream and the famous uh, dream, um, the angel uh, is announcing something, but before, getting into the narrative, I would like to tell you that this is a painting by Philippe de Champagne. And you have probably noticed that now the composition has changed completely. I mean, the, uh, the artist is more daring. The, the angel really is floating from above, suspended uh, in a kind of a very innovative way. If you remember the other annunciations that we have seen, although uh, imply the presence of Our Lady and the angel, they were always, and the angels were always on the ground. And this one is in the sky, so to speak. But there is also a reason because it's a dream. It, it's not really a, a factual um, presence of the angel on the ground. So I think the Champagne decided also to suspend the angel because it's a dream. Um, the, the painting is a 1642 and it's at the National Gallery in London. So you can admire this painting in London. And the, the size is a two meters by one, 51 meters and a half, so relatively big. Now, um, the angel appears to St. Joseph in a dream to confirm that the Virgin Mary had conceived Christ through the Holy Ghost. So as I said, Champagne shows you the angel above and uh, is uh, surrounded by this cloud of light and you can see he's pointing with his uh, left arm upwards to say, to confirm it's the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And then with the other arm on the, the right hand arm uh, points towards the Virgin Mary. Look at the Virgin Mary and she's praying. Do you remember in the body language the crossed arms on her chest means that she's accepting, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord be done unto me according to thy word. She's reading a book, or she was in the middle of reading a book. But also, if you look at the, uh, the pre-dieu, the prayer desk, you see at the bottom, there's a white cloth. And again, if you go to the um, National Gallery of London uh, website, you can magnify that detail, and you see that there are uh, knitting needles and uh, uh, woolen ball, so uh, as if there is a reference to a domestic life. Uh, unlike uh, uh, St. Joseph, uh, who was a carpenter, and if you look at the bottom on the floor, you see the instrument, the tools, find out where the mallet, the chisel, the axe, the hammer, where, where are they? They are there, they're there to show you that he's a, a carpenter and a joiner. But at the same time, there is this uh, contrast between this beautiful chair, um, look at how 
carefully Champagne had carved the arms and the shape of the chair is resting on this comfortable a padded pillow, a tasseled pillow, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the dresses, so the, the costume is very, very simple. There's the yellow and light, very light uh, blue. So St. Joseph is reassured. And this is the moment when on the 17th of December, we talk about the genealogy that is uh, deeply linked to St. Joseph. I promised you to show you this stained glass window again. Do you remember, was the first talk and it was very quick because there was a reference to the uh, to this uh, genealogy in the um, first week, but there is again on the third week. Remember that it's not a linear progression of facts and events. So we go backwards and forwards, and uh, the the idea that if the the church decides, it's very important to think about again to focus on the genealogy then you have to read it again. Now, the stained glass window is in Wales, in Somerset, in England. You remember that it's called the golden window because there's a profusion of gold, of yellow, and it's called the Jesse window. And Jesse is um, a figure in the Old Testament, uh, King David's father, and uh, um, is the beginning of the geneal genealogy. But if you read the um, the reading on the 17th of December, the genealogy goes back to Abraham. So here you have at the very bottom, Jesse sleeping. I don't know if you can see him, but uh, it, uh, I will I'll give you a magnified and enlarged picture, but it's at the very bottom in the middle, there's Jesse sleeping. And then there is a kind of a sinuous line, a white line connecting all the other figures. Very important, the one above Jesse, the Virgin Mary, uh, either side of the Virgin Mary, on the left, King David with a harp, and uh, on the uh, right, King Solomon. And then going up, you have the crucifixion, but the extraordinary element about this stained glass window is that it combines the two readings of the genealogy of Christ, who comes from Jesse and Abraham, but also the very top, it's very difficult to see, but uh, there's the redemption. There's a cry, there's Christ, risen Christ. And I hope to use again uh, very carefully my, yes, this is God. I don't know if you can see the arrow. This is God. And then there's the um, Holy Spirit here at the very top. So it's quite a, a very interesting way to combine the two readings uh, together. Now I'll give you some details. This is the Virgin Mary with the little Jesus. Uh, uh, very, um, thoughtful, I would say, very tender, but thoughtful. This is the crucifixion. And uh, remember, it's a 1340. It's one of the most beautiful stained glass windows that we have in this country. And as I said last time, um, we have a beautiful cathedrals with beautiful stained glass windows in York, in Canterbury, in Wales, in Exeter. Right, let's introduce the next one. So this is St. Joseph and the genealogy, okay? This is a narrative that uh, I think we have to conclude here. But you remember that we talked about uh, um, St. John the Baptist. We have seen him baptizing Christ. We went back to the beginning when the angel sent, said to uh, Zachariah, um, he was uh, about to be a father. So let's go. Uh, back to the story. And this is by Giovanni Di Paolo. And uh, it, it's a very uh, good thing that uh, uh, we can see all the paintings that are, I'm going to show you at the National Gallery in London. And Giovanni Di Paolo, a uh, Sienese artist, uh, this work uh, um, goes back to the mid 1450s, and it's the, uh, the birth of John the Baptist. Look at the way uh, Giovanni Di Paolo painted this event. First of all, Elizabeth is extremely tired uh, in bed, in that wonderful red bed. She's sleeping. Now, John the Baptist, alive and very lively, I would say, and uh, uh, in the, the arms of a maid. And the other one, the one in orange uh, on the left-hand side, um, she's warming up the cloth near the fireplace to wrap up 
uh, John the Baptist. On the right hand side, you see uh, Zachariah writing something. This is very important because when um, they had to give uh, the name to the future John, they had to decide, of course, which name. And uh, Elizabeth said, I want him to be called John. And uh, remember that Zachariah is, um, is uh, numb, they can't talk. And um, relatives, neighbors say, no, 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 why John? Nobody in your family is named John. There's no reason why you should call him John. Remember that uh, it, it was in the Annunciation that the angel said that they had to call him John. And um, so Elizabeth uh, asked uh, Zachariah um, his consent, if he wanted to call him John, and he writes down the name John. And from that moment, he recovers uh, his speech. So uh, he can talk. So the name was John. And I would like um, to stress that John, uh, the name John is um, God gives grace or God, uh, yes, gives grace. So it's, a, uh, it's very relevant to the um, to what John is going to do as a forerunner of Christ. These are details. Um, and John is looking at his father. And his father is writing down the name. And the next one is when John goes to the wilderness. And uh, we don't know exactly if he goes when he's a child or a teenager or if he's an adult, but uh, uh, Giovanni Di Paolo is the same artist, okay? The, all the paintings that I'm, I'm going to show you now are by Giovanni Di Paolo. They are at the National Gallery. And uh, the wilderness, why? Uh, he wanted to, to preach, to pray, to fast. He has really to prepare himself to the coming of Christ. And I think it's lovely the way Giovanni Di Paolo has represented uh, John the Baptist as a young boy, uh, ready to go. He leaves the, the crenellated, fortified town with this red chimney, and he begins his um, way towards the wilderness. Now, at the time of 1450s in Siena, they didn't have the idea of wilderness in the desert, in the Holy Land. So you see that it's rocky, uh, mountains and look carefully at this image because he's ready our John to start his journey with his bundle stick very few things he needs remember he's going to fast to um, to preach uh, and uh, to pray and He's a huge, I mean, as a figure, because if you look at the towns or the, the, the houses are very, very small, because at the time it was important to, to um, emphasize the importance of certain elements. In this case, it's John that is important, not the cities. But look at the agricultural layout. It's beautiful, the way everything is divided. All the fields are divided. It's about civilization. He wants to leave that. And on the right-hand side, do you remember the, the way the stick was held? It was on the right shoulder, there is on the left shoulder. So in a way, Giovanni Di Paolo wants to show you a kind of progression in time that gets tired. I don't know if you use your rucksack uh, to go to school and sometimes you have to move the rucksack around because you get tired. The same to uh, our John that he uh, wants really to uh, to relieve uh, his shoulder, his um, right shoulder, and to uh, transfer the weight on the left. Now, the, um, this is the baptism, and uh, again, there are four um, predellas. These predellas are box-like uh, elements that would be at the bottom of uh, uh, a bigger painting, a bigger table, and um, you have on the left-hand side the baptism, because that's the, the end. Well, we will see that the end will be more tragic, but uh, it's the, the final moment when uh, John the Baptist baptizes uh, Christ. And uh, you see a detail on the right hand side about um, the angels, uh, always with a cloth. There is always a cloth in, the, uh, in these uh, panels. And I would like to uh, remind you of your baptism, so important for us. And uh, baptism is about water to purify, to cleanse, oil, 
uh, again to, to purify, they give you, when they baptize you, a new dress because you are a new person and they give you a name. A name is very, very important because that name identifies you. Remember, John uh, received that name and you are blessed in the name of uh, Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So there is a, a kind of union between your name and the name of the Trinity. Then you light uh, a candle, your godfathers uh, uh, and your, your parents uh, held or uh, hold a candle because uh, you receive light from darkness and also the, um, the presence of the godfathers and the parents are very, very important because they have to help you to uh, stay faithful to the church and Christ. I'm afraid the end of uh, John the Baptist's life is very tragic because uh, I was unsure to show you this uh, predella, but I think that you are, you are um, old enough. Uh, John the Baptist uh, didn't like, didn't, I mean, criticized the way King Herod uh, uh, led his life and he criticized his uh, marriage. Uh, so uh, the King Herod didn't like that. But uh, he organized a banquet, a feast, and um, um, especially his wife didn't like John um, Heriodas. And uh, uh, in this moment, you see the, the, the head of John the Baptist held on a platter. Uh, what happened? Because of Salome, um, Herodias' um, daughter, uh, danced. And she danced so beautifully that King Herod was really taken uh, in another world, and the, she, he said to Salome, "You, I mean, you can ask me anything, even half of my reign." And the, she consulted. She asked uh, her mother. Her mother said, "I want the um, John the Baptist head." So that that's the end of it. And you can see the banquet, the feast. And you see a, a detail, and all the people horrified, horrified by by that. Now. I don't want to finish with this because, of course, uh, today it's the Gaudete Sunday. It's the rejoice. Uh, it's really be, be joyful. And this is a, um, a painting by Correggio. And uh, it's really uh, beautiful, very, very small. It's called the Madonna of the Basket. Uh, was made uh, in 1524. It's really small. It's a 33 centimeters by 25. And um, you can admire it at the National Gallery in London. I chose it because for many, many reasons, I'm really um, very keen on this painting, but it's in pink, in, I, I would say rose. Uh, the, the Virgin Mary is not uh, wearing a blue ultramarine or lapis lazuli uh, mantle, but it's rose. The rose is the color of the Gaudete. Gaudete is the, the Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent and it's rejoiced, be, be happy. And uh, as you can see, our lady is trying to put um, a jacket on a very restless child who is distracted by something on the left-hand side, leaves. And I'm sure that mothers and fathers can really sympathize with our lady trying really to keep the, the little baby still and eventually uh, to, um, to put on this, this jacket. But look at the tenderness and uh, the, 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 the way um, Our Lady is doing this. Now, Joseph uh, in the background, you probably see him, is working and uh, the, the painting is called uh, Madonna with the basket because there is a basket on the, on the left hand side in the, um, in the bottom. Now, there are angels, as you can see, that they, are, they come from annunciations that I showed um, last time, uh, Beato Angelico in rose. And uh, rose is a color that it's a combination of white and pink. And there is a, a kind of uh, um, um, artist who wrote a book, Cennini, Cennino Cennini, who said that that type of color was made of white St. John. So there was a type of white that was called St. John's, like St. John the Baptist, and, uh, and of course red, that is the color of the passion and also of divinity in a way. So the, the, the rose has a meaning and uh, uh, the, the vestments on, the, uh, on the, the third Sunday of uh, Advent, the priests wear um, rose 
uh, vestment uh, for that for that reason. Now rejoice. This is my last uh, uh, sentence uh, in the entrance antiphon. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Indeed, the Lord is near. So this is the end, and I have to rejoice because I pass over um, to uh, Brother James, and I hope he is there. Yes. Uh, All right. C can I just begin now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully, incline thy ears unto our prayers, enlighten the darkness of our minds by the grace of thy heavenly visitation, who live us and reign us with God the Father in the unit of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So, as Maurizio just mentioned, this Sunday it is traditional for the priest to wear rose-colored vestments instead of the purple that is normally worn during Advent. The rose-colored vestments are a sign to us that Christmas is drawing near. In fact, we are now halfway through the four weeks of Advent. Roses obtained, I think, I mean, I'm, after what Maritza said, I'm having doubts about this, but I thought, I, I think it's made by mixing purple with white. Uh, anyway, just take, take this as a metaphor, if that's not true. Um, so, in the, in the sense, the rose vestments are as if uh, the purple vestments that are normally worn during Advent are being mixed with the white or gold vestments that are worn at Christmas. Um, so the joy of Christmas is drawing near and it starts to affect us. The purple color, which represents our longing for the child Jesus and our uh, penitence and waiting for him, is being slowly replaced by white, which represents the joy we look forward to having at Christmas when we meet the baby Jesus once more. So this Sunday is tinged with notes of joy. And so it is, as Maritza mentioned, appropriately called Gaudete Sunday, Rejoice Sunday. Uh, the word Gaudete is taken from the first words of the reading from St. Paul, uh, which we read today at Mass, at least in the old rite. In the new rite, it was, the reading was different, uh, but this was the intro in, in the new Mass, which is uh, Gaudete in Domino Semper Iterum Dico Gaudete which is translated as rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And we must rejoice in the Lord because we know that he became man to save us from all that is evil, from sin, from the devil, hell, and death. We must rejoice because he decided to save us not by publishing a decree of forgiveness from his distant glory in heaven, which of course he could have done, but by humbling himself and becoming man for our sake. And he humbled himself, not just by becoming man, but uh, by be becoming a small baby for us, born of poor parents in a town of no importance. He lived a difficult life and died on the cross for us and shed all of his precious blood up to the last drop. This all proves to us, if we need any proof, how much God loves us, that he not only forgave us, but decided to forgive us by suffering for us by receiving on his own shoulders all the punishment that we deserve for our sins. All he asks us to do is to respond to him by following his commandments and remaining united to him in prayer and most especially through the sacraments. It is for this reason that we rejoice. We rejoice because our Lord offers us salvation. All we have to do is accept it by responding to the call that he offers us. So let us spend these last two weeks of Advent reflecting on how we are responding to our Lord's call. And let us make an effort with his grace to redouble our commitment to him. It is only in him that we find deliverance from evil. It is only in him that we find salvation, freedom and joy and everlasting happiness in the life to come. The false promises which the world offers us may seem tempting at times, but those of us who have experienced them know that they are nothing more than uh, empty lies that end up 
in frustration and unhappiness. This Christmas, when we kneel in spirit at the grot in Bethlehem, let us once more renew our baptismal promises, renouncing Satan, the world, and its empty promises. And let us redouble our commitment to our Lord, resolving to joyfully accept the salvation which he offers us every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, so we have, at the moment, we have one question, if you want then to, to write other question. Um, it's from uh, Simone. One second. You need to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Just say it okay, chance. I'm going to say it. It's actually Simone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Simone wanted to ask when you show the um, painting of Ghirlandaio, uh, where Zachariah receives the message from the angel. On the wall, there were lots of um, bassorilievos and scenes on the background. And Simone was asking what scenes were those? If Very good. Wow, Simone. I'm going back to the, uh, to the presentation and uh, so we can see it. Right, very good, Simone, a wonderful question. Now, the, the, the representation of the setting here. Right. Can you see it now? Yes, okay, right. So um, every time a Ghirlandaio uh, sets a scene from the Old and New Testament, uh, he tries to uh, set it in a, a kind of a, um, a urban um, Florentine um, scape. What, what does that mean? That what you're looking at it's actually a late 15th century city, probably Florence. Now, the one in the middle is a kind of a triumphal arch. Now, if you live in London, you have probably seen a marble arch or the uh, Hyde Park Corner uh, arch, the Duke of Wellington arch. And these were arches that were built um, at the end of a, a campaign, a, a war, a war, just to um, to be uh, triumphantly happy that uh, they were they were they won the war. So it's a kind of a Roman tradition. So this is the the, the fruit of Gelandaio's imagination. So usually there are battles, battles at the very top. The bar relief show you uh, battles. One possibly by the Florentines. Uh, so it's a celebration of the victories, but there's no reference to a specific arch like, like that. It's the, the fruit of the imagination. But if you look, for example, at the one at the scene on the right-hand side, so at the very top, the, the, there are some horses, there's a flag, there are uh, people stampeded by the horses, but in the lower part, uh, there is like a general, that is uh, addressing a crowd, so it's victorious. So it's in a way, it's a uh, it's a symbol of victory. Uh, so it doesn't reflect. Do you remember Simone where the scene took place? So the scene took place in the Temple of Jerusalem. So the Temple of Jerusalem was not like this architecture; it was completely different. So Ghirlandaio uses his imagination to set the scene in a Florentine cityscape that is just the imagination. But if you look on the right-hand side where the ladies are, 
there is a, a view uh, going into the, the background and there is a building that is quite uh, faithful, very realistic, like a building that you could see in Florence at the time. So just to, to, to answer your question very, very shortly, there are battles. Uh, okay, there are battles. Did I answer your question, uh, Simone? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Simone. Beautiful question. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask why does Mary always have a book with her? Oh, beautiful question. A blue, you said. A blue... Uh, Look. Look. A book, a book. Ah, oh, very good. Uh, because um, the fact that she becomes, or she is, the mother of God is prophesied... No, no. Uh, is, pro is prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah... Uh, if you read, if you follow the readings these weeks, the first reading generally is from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah says that a virgin will conceive and he prophesies what's happening at the Virgin Mary. So the Virgin Mary, who is very uh, conscientious and she studies a lot and she reads uh, the Old Testament, because remember, the New Testament has not been written yet, the Old Testament. So the artists represent the Virgin Mary with a book because in a way she has the, the confirmation. Oh, what I'm reading is exactly what I'm, what it's happening now. Did I answer your question? Was that your question? Was it Margarita who asked? Martina, Martina. <laughs> yes, it's funny. It, it's like Martina that uh, you, uh, it's something happening to you, uh, and uh, that, that something is written in the book. Yes, that's fine. I think that. Another question from Katerina. Why in these pictures there are some people looking at us? Mm, very good, Katerina. <laughs> Why in this picture there are uh, people looking at us? Now, this is a very good way from the artist to make the people represented engaged with the viewer. So if, for example, you see people who are not looking at us, uh, we, we are not really involved. We, we think, oh, they don't consider us. But if there are people looking at us, it means that you feel as if you are part of the scene. So you are part of the picture. And in a way, it was also a little bit arrogant to, to show you um, that kind of attitude to say, here I am, I am from the Tornabuoni family, I'm a very important family in Florence, I bear witness to this extraordinary event, an angel announcing to Zachariah that his son is called John, and uh, I'm here, and I want to show you that. So there are uh, different reasons, but it's, it's to connect you with the, with the painting. Did I answer your question, Katerina? Is it clearer? Yes, thank right. you. Thank you, thank you. I think this was the last one. I'm just checking. Did I... No, I can stop the sharing. Good, I think we have, we can, uh close the this lesson uh, the next one will be on saturday
the 19th. Just remember, it's Saturday, not Sunday. So Saturday, always at 5 p.m. You will find the list of, uh, you can find now the list of paintings and uh, biblical readings on, uh, on our website, the John Henry Newman Cultural Center website. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now? Better? Yeah, okay. So, as I said, uh, next next time will be on Saturday. There will be the last lesson for this uh, series. Then we don't know if Maurizio is thinking something else. But uh, So it's Saturday at 5 p.m. And the list of uh, paintings and biblical readings are available on our website at www.jhnewmanculturalcenter.org.uk. And, and then for the fourth lesson, there will be the day before a possibility to, to uh, download it. Good. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah. One second, Maurizio. Go. No, what I just say, don't don't miss the, the last one because you have the most beautiful canticles in the whole Bible, the Magnificat and the Benedictus. So that would be really uh, fantastic before before Christmas. And I would like to thank you, really, all the children who had the patience to, to follow Simone, Martina, and Caterina to ask the questions. But everybody, thank you very much. And uh, Gaudete, uh, rejoice on this Sunday. Thank you. And thank you, Brother James. And see you soon. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Where's Benny? Benny. Benny, ti chiamo Maurizio. Where's Benny? Oh. <laughs> 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 Tommaso. Ok, tu lo lascio qui. Luckily, we intercepted Benny because she showed up <laughs> naked. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've, we have a question we, I missed. Maurizio, oh. from Tom. Tom, do you want to ask? We are still on. I have to, no, yeah. to join again. Well, I was, I was a bit embarrassed because we had a lot of very... Oh, you left. Come here. What? Sorry, days. one second, one second. Uh, because Maurizio was... No, 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 no. <laughs> Maurizio. One sec. There we go. Oh, here we are. Please, Tom. I, I was a bit embarrassed. We had some such interesting questions from, uh, from uh, various people, and I had a rather mundane point. I was going to put it to, to Brother James, but I think he, maybe he's gone. Um, it seems to me that temple priests um, were active between the age of 30 and 50. Then they retired, as they were instructed in Numbers 4. So Elizabeth would have been even younger. We have this ancient tradition of a very old couple who couldn't possibly, like, like, like Abraham and Sarah, uh, who couldn't possibly have conceived a child. So I, I just wondered if this was, um, uh, I don't know, when did it begin? There was no reason for this ancient couple tradition. Okay, she was old, she was barren, that's the important point. But so ancient, it's nonsense. <laughs> she was probably in her 40s. Sorry. Yes, ah, was, uh, Hello, hello, Tom, thank you. That was something that intrigued me as well, because they were probably, four, she was 43 and he was 45, 47. I, I think maybe at that time, um, that was kind of not, not old people, but considering that the Virgin Mary was a 14 or 13, probably there, there is this distance in age. But you are right. I mean, the, the main thing was 
that she was barren and uh, probably the representation, more, many um, uh, references are based on writings uh, like the golden legend, like the um, ap ap apocryph apocryphal uh, reading uh, books uh, that they gave you this idea of an elderly couple, but uh, you're right. I mean, they were not that old. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. That, yes. But in, in paintings, they always look like St. Joseph, for example, in the uh, in the Champagne, uh, Philippe Champagne painting is quite a young man. It's not that old, but in other paintings, it, it always looks very, very old. That, that's a kind of a head with long beard, exactly. And uh, there's a kind of pic pictorial iconographic uh, tradition, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, he was that old when, or he was that young. We, we, we don't know exactly, but uh, um, yes, I agree with the, Elizabeth and Zachariah. Certainly they were older than, than Mary. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's yeah. for sure. That's it. But thank you. Thanks, Tom, for, for, for asking this question. Thank you. I yeah. don't know if, if the father is no, it's not, no, it's it's not, gone. It's because it, it's got a Next time. For the next time. Good. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.